I'm going to dive into God's word today for us. I've got just a little bit of time um, to do that. And I want us to, to look at, at God and his word. And I want us to see what God might have for us as we think about God's peace being found in holiness. I think for us, what, what I'm going to have to do is probably just briefly describe what peace is and then talk a little bit about what holiness is. And then I want to connect the dots for us. So, so let's go ahead and just dive right in. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 to 24, the scriptures say, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. I'm going to explain that in just a second. He says that he wants the God of peace to sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. We're working our way through the book of 1 Thessalonians, and we've been doing that for several months now. And so here we are at the end of the book, and Paul goes into a little bit of, of, of instructions at the end that he wants us not to forget, some instruction that he wants us to remember as he closes out the book. And so we've talked about um, rejoice in everything or in everything um, uh, give thanks. And then the other verse was um, that we pray without ceasing. So he just sort of does a rapid fire uh, instruction for us. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. And, and then uh, last week, we kind of tracked that a little bit further into the verse that we're looking at today. What I want us to see today is that as he wraps up this book, one of the things that Paul wants us to experience is the peace that God gives to his children. And he says it in such a way that I think is, is interesting. Uh, he says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. He wants us to be made holy, which is what the word sanctify means. It just basically means to be set apart um, for God, by God, for his service. To be set apart for God's use. And he could have just said that, I think, at the end of this book. He could have just said, now may God sanctify you in every way. He could have just said exactly what he says here. Now may, the, now may God sanctify you completely and in every way keep you blameless until the Lord Jesus comes. But he designates the word peace for God. May the God of peace sanctify you completely. There's, there's no surprise here. I, I think you might be able to even relate with the Thessalonians that they were living in a time, I think much like any other time in history. I don't want to elevate them or sort of make it lower or higher than the, the experience that we have even in our culture today. They were living in times where I think they were, they, they were troublesome times, times of transition. The Thessalonian church actually lived in a, in a highly uh, transient place, much like Hampton Roads. We talked about that months and months ago. So here in Thessalonica, as he's teaching them all the things that he's taught them, he wants to settle them, to ground them in some truth as he lets them go, as he finishes his word. And he says, I want the God of peace to make you holy. And he's going to do that. I believe that. And that's how he closes his book. The God of peace himself will accomplish this work. That's the main takeaway as I look at this passage. There's no way to force peace. Have you ever tried to do that? Have you ever just tried to tell yourself to be cool, to chill out, to make things go away, to try to... I think what happens a lot of times with addiction is that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to self-medicate, we're trying to eat, we're trying to do anything or look for anything we can find that will actually bring the kind of peace that Paul says only God can give. There's no condemnation for you doing those things, for you and I running to other idols or running to other things looking for peace. I think what I hope you would hear today is that we're actually saying, look, I think it's understandable we would look to other places, look for other sources of peace. We're actually holding out hope that there is only one source. You can find it here with the God of peace. That's the good news of Jesus Christ, that there's no condemnation for those who would turn to him and receive the peace that God gives the kind that, that only he can give. This is the God of peace who is accomplishing this work in our lives, and he will do this for us. Now, because he's the God of peace, peace comes through his presence in our lives. I want you to think about that for a second. He is the God of peace, and the only way to receive true peace 
is to actually find it in him. So if he's promising to give us peace and he's promising to make us holy, then he's not promising something that will exist outside of his presence. The God of peace himself will do it. The God of peace himself will be with you. There's, a, there's another passage in the Bible that, that makes this case a little, a little better in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. It, Paul's doing the same thing in 2 Corinthians that, that he's doing here in, in 1 Thessalonians, the, the very same thing that we find him doing, which is at the end of his book, he's giving some rapid fire instructions for his believers. It's like the last thing he's going to say at the end of his book. And here we are in 2 Corinthians 13, 11. He says, dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful, grow to maturity, encourage each other, live in harmony and peace. Then the God of love and peace will be what? With you. I think Paul makes the case in 2 Corinthians that I'm trying to make. It's the same point I'm making in 1 Thessalonians, which is that if the God of peace himself will sanctify us, it will not come apart from his presence in our lives. If the God of love is with us, what will we experience? Love. If the God of peace is with us, what will we experience? Peace. So our hope our greatest hope, the greatest hope we could have is that God himself would come to us so that we experience peace. And the reason I say that is because I think we're praying for a lot of things to happen. And I think we might have a case of maybe, maybe some mistaken or misplaced expectations. If God would answer this prayer so that I got the thing that I'm praying about, then I would finally have peace. If he would just give me what I'm asking for, I think my problem would go away. And in some respects, that's probably true. But I think we have to lift our eyes a little higher than those prayer requests and see that true peace, lasting peace, comes in the presence of God himself. What I want for us as a people is to, is to begin to see that God is the answer to our prayer. It's a little bit of a cliche statement when we say Jesus is the answer, right? And so you probably won't hear me say that except maybe in reference like I just did. But I think they're, they're really, it's grounded in something that really is true. In just the same way as I explained it, God himself is the answer to our prayers. He has the ability to bring peace even when those specific prayer requests don't get answered right away. And that's what's amazing about walking with him. So peace is more than just conflict resolution as we see it in the scriptures. The scriptures uh, in, in the Old Testament, when, he, when they describe what peace is, they use a word that, that is shalom. It's a word that refers to universal rest. It's a word that refers to universal harmony. It's more than just sort of punching a ticket to heaven when you die. It's more than just conflict resolution. Of course, we know that it's relational peace that we have with God because of the sacrifice that Jesus made for our sins. When we turn to God, believing that Jesus was sent by God to save us, then God puts us at peace with him. And for some of us, that's the first step I think we need to take, is entering into a relationship with God where he puts all things at peace between he and us, between him and you. But I think the word peace goes a little bit further. We're, we're no longer traitors to our creator, but we're children of the heavenly father. And then, and then some, there's more beyond that. The scriptures define peace, referring to it as what I mentioned earlier, sort of a, a holistic harmony. It involves relationship with God and others, but it also, I think it extends to the perfect function of God's creation, the way he designed it. It's things working the way that he intended for them to work. That's peace. Functioning the way God designed and living in a way that God intended, that is shalom. And anytime we divert from the way God designed things or anytime that our lives are lived in a way that is contrary to, to what he intends for us, I think we begin to experience not shalom, trouble, unrest, a lack of peace. So there's hope here. 
the way to experience peace, the way to experience shalom, the way to experience what it feels like when things are right with God and when things are right in the universe is to live as God intended for us to live. And he calls that holiness or dedication to him. Maybe for some of you, the dots were connected. Let me just connect those dots. What I'm saying then is, is that we are experiencing peace to the degree that we have dedicated ourselves to God. You see that? When we, when we or an area of our lives, when, when there's an area that is experiencing lack of peace, we find the root of that problem to be a need for God's presence in that area a need to dedicate ourselves in that area to God and trust him. And do you know what happens? The God of peace comes to us and meets us and gives us peace. That's where we find peace in holiness. You see, the word holiness, now to kind of describe what that is, holiness is basically being set apart. If you were to do a, a word study on the word holiness, it simply means to what he calls be sanctified or to be set apart for God's use. The, the, if I could reduce that to one word, we've used this word over the summer a few times, I would say dedicated. Something in the temple that was made holy, if you look at the Old Testament, if it was made holy for God's service, they would dedicate that to the Lord. And if we were to live a life of holiness, it would look like us dedicating ourselves in every area of ourselves to the Lord. Do you know what the result of that would be? Peace. So it's real simple, right? If I can just do a math equation, holiness equals peace. We could all walk out of here and then just put things in motion and make that happen. The problem for us is actually that, that in many cases, we are resistant to God. We are resistant to what he has for us. We are resistant to his design for us. And in many cases, even in my own life, I've been resistant to what he's calling me to do. I feel tension there. I feel resistance there. I'm unable to actually follow. And what happens at that point is a lack of devotion to him, a lack of holiness, which in my own heart creates unrest, a lack of peace. My hope for us as a church is that whatever God might be calling you to do, whatever step of faith he might be asking you to take today in this service, as you come and as you participate in worshiping with God, he calls us to follow him. And in following him, wherever he leads, that is how I would define holiness. And that's where you'll find peace. You see, holiness just, it really isn't just a set of behaviors. When we think of holiness or we think of someone who's holy, we might actually think of all the things that they've done that make them look holy, like going to church or like helping someone across the street when they need help. Doing all the good things that we can do, we would consider those to be holy. But in the scriptures, the way God puts it to us is that he wants us to be holy as I am holy. And it speaks more to identity and relationship than it does to behavior and action. Behavior and action flow out of identity. They flow out of relationship to God. We are to be holy, not just do holy things. We're talking about an identity shift. We're talking about something that goes way beyond you saying, look, I was a smoker and now I'm a non-smoker. I was a cusser and now I'm a non-cusser. I will deal with those however you want to deal with them. All I'm saying is that whatever you're struggling with, repentance to God and turning to him and living a life of devotion to him, looks a, it doesn't look exactly like saying, hey, this is a thing I hate. I promise I'm going to stop doing that. True repentance at its core looks like turning to God and saying, look, there's a lot of things going on in my life that aren't right. There's a lot of areas in which I'm feeling unrest, a lack of peace, and I'm realizing that at its core, there is a lack of devotion to you, God. And so before I attempt to make all these changes in my life, Lord, I'm turning to you in devotion to you. I'm turning myself over to you and saying, let my life be lived in accordance with how you intend let it be lived the way you want, God. And then you do whatever changes you think need to be made. But God, I'm surrendering everything, even those bad things I hate. And even those good things I do for all the wrong reasons, I give them all up. And I'm asking you, God, to turn me to you. Turn me um, and make me holy. 
That's why he phrases it this way in the scriptures. Did you notice he doesn't really put the onus on you? He doesn't say, hey, you, do what it takes to be, to be at peace with God. Hey, do what it takes to be holy. Hey, snap out of it. Quit doing all the things you're doing. Now, he's done that in chapters 3 and 4. He's done that even into chapter 5 where he addresses all of the things that the Thessalonian church needs to know about what it looks like to live in accordance with God. But at the end of it all, he summarizes it saying, look, of, of, of all of those things, here's what I want deepest for you. It's my last words to you. It's what I hope you remember above all all else, and that's this, be devoted to God, and I know he can do this in you. And it's there you'll meet, it's there where you will encounter the God of peace. And, and as, he, as he talks about sanctification and holiness, he talks about it in such a way as to describe all of who we are. Did you see that? He says, may the God of peace sanctify you wholly or completely or in every way. And then he says, I want the Lord Jesus, may, may you be held blameless or kept blameless in spirit and in soul and in body until the day that Jesus Christ returns. See, there's nothing that goes untouched by God's presence. I mean, I think for us, some of us, there's, there's the sense that maybe God um, knows about what we're doing, knows about what we're thinking, knows about what we're saying. But in a, in, a, in, a, in a real sense, I think it feels like it's hidden. But in Psalm 90 this week, in the Psalm reading that we did, it says something so interesting. It's, it's like, a, like a game of cards almost, except he's, it, just when you think about spreading the cards out across the table. And, and God says, I see, he's, or the, the psalmist, as he writes, he says, you see our sins, you have spread them out before you. He sees it all. There is no running from this God. And when he talks about holiness, he's not just talking about that one segment of your life where you get up a little extra early to go to church on Sunday, or that one part of your life where you actually really do try to go out of your way to help that one neighbor or that one person. We're talking about something that goes way, way deeper and touches everything in our lives, every single area. He says, I want you to be kept blameless in spirit and soul and body until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, until the day that Jesus returns. What Paul is, is, is anticipating is kind of a twofold statement here when it comes to holiness and God's peace. The first part of God's peace in holiness is that it's progressive. It's not necessarily immediate. It's something that sort of progresses over time so that over time we begin more and more to dedicate parts of ourselves that we were refusing or at least resisting or maybe just plain ignorant of. To, we, we begin to dedicate those things slowly in time to God. And over time, we begin to experience more and more peace that God gives. And he also says, by referencing the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that this progressive work of being made holy by God, experiencing God's peace, will come to its completion, its fulfillment, when Jesus Christ returns and we are with him forever. That's why I think he mentions the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You remember me talking about God's presence, right? That's the only way to experience true peace. And what greater way, what more fulfilling way to experience the peace of God, what greater way to experience what it means to be wholly dedicated to him than when he physically returns to this earth to take us with him. And the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these things. Guys. We are in his presence through the work of the Holy Spirit. He is drawing us into his presence and he's holding out hope presently for the peace that only God can give. You can experience that. But he's also holding out hope for that day when Christ comes in the flesh to take us with him, to make all things new, like we find in Revelation 21.5. Behold, I am making all things new. That's my hope for us. And he says even here, that holiness uh, for us, it, it's, it's as, as we mentioned in, Re in Revelation 21, 5, it's, it's that God is coming to make all things new. It doesn't say that he's going to make all new things. Did you see that? So he's not going to just come do away with this and then whatever the next world is, we just have no idea what that looks like. It's just completely new things. Trees look more like cars and cars look more like trees. Everything's just different. I, I don't know if it's that way. He's making all things new. He's making what we experience in ordinary life new. He's making it without sin. 
And the beauty in that is that holiness isn't other than, it's not some other weird thing that you think of when someone describes something as holy. It's living a life in dedication to God. It's not some other than experience. It wouldn't just be like saying, okay, God, I'm going to dedicate myself to you. I'm going to be holy. I'm going to turn over. I'm going to turn myself over to you. I'm going to try and step out here and believe in you. And then God goes, great, good. Now you're going to Africa and you're going to, you're going to give the rest of your life over there. And I'm just going to completely just radicalize your life. And you'll never, nothing will ever be the same again. I think sometimes we're afraid of that next step because there's the unknown. God may call some of us to Africa. My hope in 30 years is that some of us would be called to go overseas as missionaries. But did you know that the majority of us will give our lives to God and he will slowly begin to make all things we experience new? So that that beach trip is holy. Not because of what you wear or don't wear. (laughs) That beach trip is holy because of who you are now. You're enjoying recreation in light of being devoted to God. That meal with neighbors that you might feel like is meaningless, that you might feel like is a waste of time, God's turning things like that and making them new again. Here's my point. To live a life in dedication to God, to live a life that really is at peace, that experiences God's peace, doesn't look like that much different from what you're doing now. He just wants to make it new. And that's, I think, for us, what makes it an ordinary thing. That's what gives holiness added value when we can see holiness in the ordinary day-to-day life. He takes the job you do, and he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily change it. <laughs> he just makes it new. He takes the relationships you have, and he doesn't necessarily change them. He makes them new. He takes the frustration you, and anger that you've felt toward God for the things that have happened to you, and he, and, he, and he walks you through those things so that he may not change what you've experienced, but he has a way of making those new. My hope is you'd turn to him. My hope is today we would experience what we can hope for in the future when he comes again. We would experience even now the presence of God, devotion to him, and let the peace of God just begin to settle down into our hearts. Would you pray with me? God.